Wimborne, Dorset. Oh, okay. okay. Mm. And I get my all my seeds from Paolo. Hey, that's what we like. I'm my Roma my is here. down to it. My Roma has already got its second leaf. My what? yellow, yellow. Oh yeah, no, I put them in the put them in the front porch. Mm. Um, uh, my little um, red cherry is, and I've got. I've, I've, I'll start the um, uh, commissiyama, the the, the uh, pepperoni. I'll start those soon as well. I do the uh, the tomatoes. I do it for a local nursery as well. Oh. Um, I've got two trays of aroma for him, so I've got about 300 Roma seedlings all coming up. Well, you're lucky because we don't have any Roma tomatoes left. In fact, we've no. only got three. No, we've got no. None of the seed companies have got tomatoes, peppers. It's a, a big problem at the moment, importing. It's a, it's an absolute crisis. Yeah, we, we're really struggling to get stuff. What, getting them over from Bergamo? Getting them from anywhere, getting any seeds, all the seed companies are struggling. So. so I was lucky when I got my last packet of about 1,500 seeds or 2,000 seeds of Roma. I guess I was lucky, was I? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we've we've got two orders with tomatoes and peppers. Um, we haven't managed to import a single packet of tomatoes or peppers since last year. Really? Yep. And the same as all the other seed companies, it's a real problem uh, with importing. It's worse for exporting, but for importing, it's it's terrible. Yeah, yeah a really real problem. We, we've got two orders of tomatoes and peppers in the UK, but they've been seized and we, we're trying to unseize them. Paperwork, Brexit. So yeah. we, we're yep. struggling terribly. You did mention to me this to a couple of years ago when I was talking to you at the Hampton Court Flower Show. Yeah. You, you did say to me then, Paola, that you said, oh, I think there's going to be problems when we have it of being able to get the seeds over from Italy. It's not like they're important. It's not like everything we eat is grown from seed. Oh, hang on a minute. It is. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> it's a real, <laughs> spot the problem. You know, it's a real big yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we won't mention the B word tonight. I promise you. Uh, I promise you. No. Good. Okay. <laughs> Right, I should be back in two seconds. Okay. Okay, well, welcome to everybody who's joined already. A little bit early, um, but that's great. Um, there are about 300 people registered on this talk, and um, I have a confession to make. I've never hosted a, a meeting that big, so I'm hoping it's all going to work out. Um, I will mute everybody before we start. Um, and... The other thing which I'll repeat in a little while is that um, we're planning or I'm recording um, this Zoom meeting. If there's anybody who doesn't want to appear, then just turn off your camera. Um, or if anybody has any objections, could you let me know? I mean, we can have a chat about that. Um, otherwise, I'll do an intro in a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll give people a few more minutes to join, I think, actually. Yeah. There's still six minutes before half past, so we ought to give it six or seven minutes, I think. Simon, um, can can you um, tell those perhaps here a little bit about Harrow Go Green? Um, yeah, so I'll do a quick introduction. I'll do an introduction again just before we start. But um, I had I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I was having a chat with a couple of officers on the on the council, um, somebody had come up with the idea of hosting some sort of um, competition to try to promote um, improvements of uh, environment and, and how you can increase biodiversity in your gardens, but also in businesses, along your roads. And then we're trying to encourage the council not to mow grass verges and so on. Um, and we just, Put this competition together it's the first time that we're running it it's been a little bit of a problem with meeting and organizing things because of um covid obviously um but we are going ahead with it um it's been a little bit delayed before we've managed to launch it if you're not from harrow unfortunately you can't enter but i understand there are i i've not seen anything the same um, with the same sort of format um, anywhere else in the country. So I don't know if it's a first, but... You're, you're trailblazing. And this is great, you know, that there's people from all over the UK, perhaps, and they can take this idea and they can perhaps contact their local councils. I mean, things like uh, wild verges. Um, mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, 97% of butterfly um, habitat has been lost in this country. And that's a huge blow. And I grew... 
nettles last year. Um, we actually sell nettle seeds, can you believe it? <laughs> um, and the reason for that is Italians still eat nettles. Nettles are one of the oldest foods. And you have to pick them with gloves, the young leaves. And they're often used with ricotta. So instead of spinach and ricotta, you have nettle and ricotta, uh, cannelloni, whatever. Anyway, I had to, I planted some behind the shed. I can't see them from the house. And my garden was full of butterflies this year. It was glorious. L little things. It, unfortunately, in this country, the, the, the most we sell our packets of um, nettles to is to people who don't like their neighbours. <laughs> Yeah, the, the trouble with nettles is controlling them, stopping them from taking over. Yeah, they're in a patch behind the shed. Uh, you, you're right, but they, they won't go anywhere else. Uh, so that, that's fine for me. Yeah, that's fine for me. I'm on the, just very quickly, I'm on the committee for Wimborne in Bloom. And although we have the town looking nice with hanging baskets and plants, one of the things the judges from the Royal Horticultural Society are looking at now is biodiversity. Great borders of your of your paths and everything and and the schools what are the schools doing about growing yeah. their own seeds that is much more of a focus on that now than there are on hanging baskets and petunias and things like that that's that's much more of a focus now yeah, and we've we've had a lot of support actually from garden designers um that's something that i'm really trying to push um we're doing a series this month of uh, a to z of native plants um just uh, I get the impression that most people assume that if you're having a wildlife garden, it's got to be just abandoned and just a right mess. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. I mean, you can plant a mix of grass <coughs> and native species. Um, I'm just trying to multitask. Um, yeah, so you can make a garden look beautiful, but also fantastic for wildlife. And that's, that's yeah. one of the things we're really trying to push. Um, get people to think slightly differently. Yeah, another thing I've done, um, Simon, I, I had uh, a panel blow down in the, in the winds a couple of weeks ago of my, my you know, of the uh, garden uh, fence. And so I put a new one up, but we made a hedgehog hole in it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a hedgehog for years. <laughs> Honestly, I have not seen a hedgehog for years. So we, we, we've made a hole in the fence big enough for hedgehogs to get through. And so, um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get some hedgehogs as well. I'm trying to get one of the local fencing guys to do that with their um, concrete gravel boards. There's somebody in um, Staffordshire, I think, producing them. It, it just means you have to have a hole about 13 centimetres yeah. in diameter and it lets, it lets hedgehogs through. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's really important, um, you know, and, and you can, if, if lots of people make little changes, that's a little big change. <clears throat> well, we're there, 7.30 almost. Nearly. Nearly. Maybe a couple more minutes, there's still quite a few people joining. Will your clock uh, sound the hour behind? No. <laughs> it doesn't work. It has no hands. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I don't know if there's any clock repairers on here, but it needs a bit of a, a service. Well, it's, it's certainly a good turnout. Yep, 130 so far. Excellent. Have you done anything like this before in Harrow? Zoom um, so we're doing we're doing a meeting like this every week or every fortnight. Um, anybody's welcome to, to join. Um, next week we have something which is a little bit of a, a passion of mine, which is green and blue roofs. Um, in Harrow, I don't know in other areas, but in Harrow, I don't see them very often. Um, and it's a fantastic thing that you can do. We, we have a lot of people building extensions, flat roof extensions. Um, and if you go into it from the beginning, um, the cost involved is not that much greater. Um, but obviously you have to plan ahead a little bit. Um, and it's not just something where you can just put seeds You can put all manner of plants in there. Um, it's a fantastic resource. I mean, 
And with our small gardens, you need every little square inch that you can grab. Okay, shall I do another quick intro and then we'll kick off. You might want to mute everyone first. Yeah. So I will mute everybody um, and then I'll try to unmute. <laughs> Okay. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'll do another, sorry for the people who've already seen this, but I'll do another quick introduction. Um, this is a talk um, from a series that we've put together for a competition um, called Harrow Go Green in the London Borough of Harrow, um, which is where Paolo is based, um, hence the, co the connection. Um, but it's something that we are working with Harrow Council on um, to develop a competition or to run a competition to try to promote ideas about increasing biodiversity in people's gardens, in their businesses, in schools, in nurseries, in colleges, um, and also try to improve the environment. So we have things like um, best um, front garden space, which could be a paved drive, but if you put some pots on there, that's gonna increase um, the resources for, for wildlife just even a little bit. Um, we are running this for the first time this year. Um, we've had a really good response already. We have judges, um, some fairly famous people like Mark Lane, which who you'll see quite often on um, Gardener's World, and also Russell Grant, who lives locally. Um, Paolo got involved. He's one of our sponsors. Um, we are also trying to promote um, the use of peat-free composts. So we have another sponsor called Melcourt, who are one of the biggest, um, or uh, one of the top manufacturers of compost in this country. Um, so I will hand over to Paolo and enjoy the evening. If you have any questions, if you'd like to just pop them in the chat, um, I'll keep having a look through that. Um, Paolo will talk for about half an hour, 45 minutes and um, then we'll go through as many questions as we can. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, buonasera. Uh, my name is Paolo and for those of you who haven't seen me or don't know me, um, I'm the importer and distributor for Frankie Seeds in the UK. Don't worry, everyone says Franchi and uh, the CH in Italian is hard. It's a bottle of Chianti. Uh, and so, but, but Franchi, Frankie, it's all good. Um, and Frankie are a really interesting company because we're actually seven generations, still the same family since 1783, which is really extraordinary, uh, especially for the horticultural um, sector. You tend to find a lot of old breweries and old bank, um, you know, in in those sectors uh hardware stores maybe but but not so much in the uh, in the gardening sector so that, that's really really nice to see um for those of you who don't know uh frankie are based in bergamo bergamo is what ryanair called milan <laughs> um yeah it's quite a long way from uh, from milan um but it's a beautiful city if you do ever get the chance if we can all travel when we can all travel we've all been vaccinated uh, you know, um, do go because it's a lovely place for a long weekend and and you just walk around and eat. There's no traffic on Upper Bergamo. Uh, it's it's a medieval um, wall which spirals from the bottom to the top of the city. And it's just such a, a, a great place just to just to, to stroll around. So that's where Frankie are based, which is actually the north of Italy. You know, Bergamo is an alpine city. And when people say to me, Oh, you know, your seeds are Italian. Are they going to grow here? Well, you can see actually a lot of comments, uh, which I was pleased to see. Oh, these grow really well here. But, you know, don't forget that Italy is 74% Alpine. You all knew that. We have the Alps and the Dolomites in the north. That's the whole of the north gone, by the way. We have the Apennines running for a thousand kilometres down the middle of Italy. And then you can even ski in Sicily. So, you know, I think when people do think of Italy, they think of, they have that sort of Dolmio view of Italy where everyone has brown eyes and, and dark hair and they all have a mama. Clearly I have a mama, uh, but you know what I mean? And, and actually 
where Frankia based Bergamo, um, Bergamo has the same amount of rainfall as Cardiff. And where my family come from, which is above Turin, a place called Biella, very nice, mm -hmm. we have wetter summers than winters. So I'm a glutton for punishment because uh, I leave London in uh, August and I go to Italy and it just rains. And so that's uh, that, that's that's how it works. And there's these two Italies, you know, people think of Italy and they think of Mediterranean. But actually, you know, think about it. We're, we're up in the mountains. Um, olives don't grow up mountains. We have butter. We have cows with bells on and we have butter and pasta. We very, very rarely eat pasta where we are in, in northern Italy. We, we have it lasagna and cannelloni, sometimes ravioli, whatever, but not very often. Um, and really the staples where we are are corn. So we have polenta, potatoes. So we have gnocchi. But the uh, the pasta of northern Italy is rice. And of course, just in the valleys below uh, are all the rice fields. And Italy is the largest producer of rice in Europe. And it's all good stuff, you know, really high quality. And of course, we have risottos. And so, you know, the talk is one minute in and I'm already talking about food. And so this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to have a look. We're going to go around Italy and vegetables. But before we do, I want to just tell you a little bit about the seed industry, because um, there's lots of preconceptions about seeds and where seeds come from and uh, about biodiversity. And we're in a real pickle at the moment because um, it just in the last century, I hope you're all sitting down for this one, but 94% um, of all the heritage vegetables that were around a century a, a, a ago have disappeared. 94% of all heritage vegetables have disappeared in just one century. And so what Frankie Seeds do is we specialize in those endangered varieties, in heritage varieties, in local varieties, like little regional um, vegetables that you find only, and then we'll have a look at some of those because they're really interesting. Um, and also new ones as well, new varieties too, but eth ethically sourced. And that's important because I don't, you know, just on heritage alone, you, it's quite difficult, but we have about 220 varieties, which we uh, believe are still from that remaining 6%, uh, which haven't been lost. And it's really important to keep them going. And, and, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you a little bit uh, about some of them. So here is a, um, here is a spinach called Viraflé, okay? So I don't know if you can see that. Oh, there you go. Uh, I've got to put it in front of me because I've got a, a screen behind me. Viraflé, is a French um, spinach. It actually comes from a suburb of, of Paris called Viraflé. And it's in a book dating to 1635. So we know it's at least from that period. And what's really interesting about it, and for all the wrong reasons, is that of this spinach, there are actually two producers. There might be three, actually. Um, and that's it. And what happens if those producers pop their clogs or you know, decide to stop producing that particular spinach. Well, that variety is gone forever to everyone. And you might say, well, you know, so what? There, there's lots of other spinaches around, but actually we've already lost 94% of the varieties. And so, you know, it's really important to keep that 6% going. So I was, I was at Hampton Court a couple of years ago. Of course, we couldn't do it last year. And I was telling this story to a, a school party and, and, uh, uh, we actually built an ark uh, at Hampton Court Flower Show two years ago. And instead of animals going on two by two, we had plants, endangered plants going on two by two. Because, you know, when you say to people endangered, people think of rhinos and pandas and rightly so and tigers and things like that. But they don't think of carrots and spinach. Uh, and so it's, it's a really, really important message. Anyway, I'm telling this story to a 12 year old and she thought for a second and she said, but don't medicines come from plants? And it was like, bang, the 12 year old not only got it, but she explained biodiversity back to me better than I had explained it to her. And the kids are switched on. You know, the kids are really, really switched on. It's their future, you know, at the end of the day. And, um, and that's a really good one. So lots of people say to me, why don't you stick those seeds in a seed bank? Ah, that's one of the worst things you can do 
to to preserve a seed, um, you, you know, to to maintain a seed. It's an insurance policy for sure, absolutely, and it's important that you do it. The best way to make sure this seed survives is for people to grow it. And so, if those producers are uh, making profit, let's let's put it bluntly, um, then they're much more likely to continue to um, to produce that seed. And and if seed companies offer it, then uh, but but unfortunately, the problem that we have in the UK is when you look at the varieties that lots of seed companies offer, there's a lot of sort of mass produced corporate varieties. You know, there's not courgette of Birmingham and courgette of Brixton and courgette of Harrow. <laughs> yeah, I've made those up. But there would have been once upon a time, there would have been a lot more regional vegetables. And it's just, you know, the, the way the, the seed industry is made up in the UK, there's lots of really massive seed companies and lots of really tiny seed companies. And there's kind of nothing in the middle. And so a lot of the tiny ones, the, the specialists are really, really passionate about what they do. And they're very good at offering uh, some of these um, regional heritage varieties. Whereas, you know, if you look at all the big brands, they all have Moneymaker, Sun Gold, Gardener's Delight, Shirley, Alicante. Um, and they're all mass produced varieties with maybe hundreds of producers for each one. So this is a, a really big thing. Another thing about these heritage varieties is lots of people will come to me and they'll say, are your seeds organic? And organic is really important because what, what, what we're talking about here is not putting chemicals unnecessarily back into the food chain and into the ecosystem. And yeah, of course it has a, a place. But it's not the be all and end all when you're talking about heritage. And I'll explain why. Um, this spinach, again, my Viraflay with three producers. Are any of those three producers going to take the time and trouble and effort? And, you know, it's a real big job to get something certified organic. Of course they're not. We're lucky enough that they are producing this spinach at all let alone getting uh, organic derogation. So, you know, you have to put that into context. Uh, I'm a big fan of organic, but in the, the scheme of things, when you're talking about varieties where there's just so few producers left on the planet, I think you have to just accept it. You can buy the seed and grow it organically, you know, at the end of the day. And it doesn't mean that the seeds are sprayed and treated and, and stuff. I just wanna actually talk about spinach for a second. And I'll make a bet with you all present. I bet that your local supermarket doesn't sell spinach. What it sells, it sells baby spinach. And that baby spinach is quite a thick leaf. And these are spinaches that can be mechanically harvested. So they're done by machine. And you get frozen spinach as well. But these, here you've got a variety which you can grow in your garden. You can sow it in the spring for the summer and in the autumn for the winter. So you get two bites of the cherry and you can do two sowings in spring and two sowings in, in, in uh, the summer, uh, in the autumn. Um, if you sow it in the summer, it tends to bolt. So that's why you kind of sow it before and after. Um, in between, let's do your Swiss chard, a very underrated vegetable, I'll come back to that. But it gives you a constant supply of leaves. And um, you've actually got something here that you can grow, which is superior to the, the baby spinach is all right, I like it, it's nice raw, it's okay to cook, but this is really, really good spinach and you can grow true spinach in your garden. And I get it, I get, you know, it's, it's a product which will wilt very, very quickly. And so I understand it, I get it, um, but, you know, grow it, spinach, absolutely really good for you. Spinach and, and, and spinach as well is, is a variety which is, is kind of universal. Um, and unlike a San Marzano tomato, which is typically Italian or a Cornish pasty, which is typically British, you know, Cornish even, um, you know, you've got something in India, it would be a dal, spinach dal, in Italy it would be spinach and ricotta, in, in Bulgaria it would be a spinach banista, which is a type of pie. Let's look at some other things. Uh, when you say Italy, I think, you know, you, you say, you think tomato, don't you? Uh, and... Uh, uh certainly you know the italians have really taken the tomato over the generations and and nice hot summers in those parts 
where it's grown. So here's another one which is endangered. So that spinach was endangered and this tomato is endangered. How do we know it's endangered? I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, an organization called Slow Food. So Slow Food are one of the largest, oh, the, sorry, they are the largest food, I won't say movement, but body uh, in the world. They're actually bigger than Oxfam in terms of size. And if any of you don't know um, who slow food are, they're, they're the easiest thing to explain. Do you know what fast food is? OK, so slow food is the opposite of fast food. It's all about regionality and provenance. It's I mentioned the Cornish pasty. What a great example of slow food. You know, it's made in Cornwall using Cornish vegetables and it's a, it's a great traditional heritage um, product and that's a great example of slow food years ago they used to be mass produced in Birmingham and, and Glasgow or whatever you know nothing like the artisan uh, food which the Cornish are very proud of and rightly so because it's a cracking it's a cracking um, dish but that goes for lots of other regional dishes um, so anyway back to the San Marzano tomato this is on the slow food arc of taste which is basically a register of endangered uh, ingredients endangered uh, vegetables, endangered, uh, endangered foods, and if you if you go into slow food and you type in arc of taste, uh, you'll be able to see all the varieties which are sort of on on that list that are in, endangered in the UK, in Italy, in each country. It's really interesting again for all the wrong reasons. So the San Marzano tomato uh, comes from San Marzano, the, the Naples area, and this would have been grown by hand uh, on the slopes of Vesuvius. Um, it would have been grown by hand, picked by hand, canned by hand. Nowadays, of course, there's mechanization. And so the tomatoes that they're using, they're still San Marzano type tomatoes. So San Marzano long, uh, very meaty, hardly any seeds inside, very thin skin. They are the best cooking tomatoes. They're absolutely superb. But the growers now are using much more modern varieties. They're using varieties which are harder, which don't split. These are very delicate and they would split. They're just not suited to, to mechanization. So again, here is another variety that you can grow at home, which is superior. And how many times have you heard people say, and I love this, when, when you hear people say, when I was young, you know what's coming next, tomatoes used to taste better. And that's the reason is that a lot of these old varieties, they don't suit our, our modern um, life, uh, you know, agricultural techniques and lifestyles and stuff. And so they've actually gone by the by, not all of them, thank God, um, but, but, but some of them. So that's a really good one um, to grow. And so again, it's regional, it's San Marzano from Naples. This is the one from Florence, ugly, misshapen, horrible hard stalk in the middle, guess what? really good flavor you know you don't see them in the supermarket and if you did they'd sell them under the name of ugly tomatoes and charge a premium or something you know um then you've got things like this ah oh, one of my favorites this one is called cuor di bue variety names never change language they're just like people's names so again you do get some domestic seed brands that that change the names of their varieties give them a french or italian sounding name to make them sell better but they're actually uh, sort of dutch varieties or, or wherever they're from you know um and so the ox heart tomato is a variety which you can cut in half and it's a beef tomato. It's like a medium sized beef tomato, but it's, it doesn't have all of the, those uh, ridges. Oh, look, I'm an, I'm an invisible man. And um, what you get is you get steaks of tomato. There are no pockets of water and seeds in there. You get slabs, you get steaks of tomato. Sweet. If you were to drop this tomato, it would go splat. Uh, if you were to drop the costaluto, you know, it would roll. It, it's it's a, a different beast. And this one comes from Liguria. Now there are no accidents in Italian cuisine. Um, what else comes from Liguria? Basil and so and olive oil. They do have olive oil there. And so you get uh, the tomatoes, basil and and olive oil. You know, you don't have to invent anything. This is a cracker. It's one of the lowest acidities of all the Italian tomatoes. Really sweet. You can grow it outside, certainly in the south of England, uh, from the Midlands downward. I guess uh, you can grow this one outside. Um, perhaps further north, you, you'd need a greenhouse, but it's a cracker. The other thing about this one 
you'll often hear people like Raymond Blanc talk about them because, um, and he will call it Coeur du Boeuf, Coeur du Boeuf, tomato, or, or Coeur du Bois, ox's heart. And that's because borders stop people, they don't stop plants. And so you can have varieties which are sort of national variety of, of two or, or three countries you know at the end of the day and this is one of them this is sort of an ang uh, an italian uh, french um tomato absolute cracker and then i'll show you another one this is one called prince borghese and it's bigger than a cherry that's a cherry and it's bigger than a cherry but it's smaller than a plum and this is the variety that is used to make sun-dried tomatoes um, and again, it has all the right characteristics. It's an old variety. It comes from Puglia. All of those tomatoes I showed you are regional. They're local. Someone said to me the other day, it's interesting that you say local when they're Italian, but Cornish pasty is a great, oh, Wiltshire ham is a great example of, you know, two, two good examples of local foods. So is Brie de Mure. So if, if, you, if, you, if you take that attitude and you say, well, Wiltshire ham is local, but um, San Marzano isn't, is Wiltshire ham in Italy, is that still a local? Of course it is. It's made with passion. It's made with local ingredients. Um, you know, so, so the, the argument is, is, uh, is the same. Um, so what you can do with this tomato, since we don't have enough sun to sun dry, you can use your oven at home and you can actually uh, just use the bread proving um, setting. But what many people do is they hang the tomatoes upside down from a garage or a shed, somewhere cool, dark and airy at the end of the season. Just pull up the whole plant, cut the root off and then uh, you'll have eaten all the red tomatoes. And then just as they as they mature, they'll shrivel slightly. They, they won't sun dry, but they'll sun blush and you can eat them almost up until Christmas. You know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there was not a Tesco's on every street corner. If you didn't do this, if you didn't preserve your bounties for the winter months, you died, you starved, you know, you didn't have food for your family. And so lots of these traditions, you know, people are, are, are coming back to, but you can't do it with moneymaker or sun gold. It, the tomatoes would just rot and go off. Um, so, you know, this is a specific variety called Prince Borghese. And if any of you have any questions, oh, you mentioned that tomato, you can always email us at the end. I'm going to show you some other varieties. This is um, a pumpkin called Marina di Chioggia. Chioggia is in the Veneto region. Now, the Veneto region is the coldest region of Italy. You won't believe me, but you can Google it. The coldest ever recorded temperature in uh, the Veneto region, which is the Dolomites, it was in a little village called Buza di Mana up in the Dolomites, um, but not the top of a mountain, but in a village. And um, it was recorded at minus 48.3 centigrade below zero. So that's that's pretty cold. Um, anyway, this, uh, this pumpkin has really knobbly thick skin and it stores brilliantly. And so again, it would have been one of those varieties, uh, it, you know, that, that's an, ex it's not exaggeration, that's, it was 48.3, but that's not typical of the whole region, but it is the coldest region of Italy. So these were varieties, again, that you could store right through the winter. And in fact, when you're peeling it, you'll all be cursing me because it's like bulletproof. You, you really need uh, 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 some, you know, put some some uh, elbow grease into it, into actually peeling it. It's believed to be the oldest pumpkin in Europe. And it was bought back from the Americas. Um, a wild pumpkin was bought back from the Americas and it was bred in the Veneto region with two cultivated uh, varieties, you know, similar to pumpkins, uh, squashes. And uh, anyway, it, it, it's uh, considered to be the oldest. It's really nice. It's a medium sized pumpkin, quite sweet, not as sweet as a butternut, which I prefer when I'm doing something like a pumpkin soup. I think butternut's really sweet. I, I love pumpkin soup or roast pumpkin. Um, how many of you grow pumpkins and zucchini, courgettes? We're the only English speaking country in the world that doesn't say zucchini, by the way. We say courgette uh, because of our proximity to, uh, to France. We don't say eggplant either. We say aubergine. Um, so how many of you eat the flowers or don't eat the flowers? It would be like getting half your tomato crop and throwing them away. You're only eating half the plant and you pick the flowers in the morning. Why do you pick them in the morning? 
because they're open. And, you know, when they're closed, well, you can pick them with a bumblebee inside or an earwig. Um, <laughs> um, but you pick them open and then all you're going to do is you're going to twist the, the crown at the bottom and the crown and the stamen inside will come out. And then you're left with what is essentially a petal. Don't listen to all the restaurateurs and the TV chefs. Oh, darling, you must stuff your zucchini flowers. Rubbish. All you're going to do is get a batter, just a, a straight tempura batter, flour, water, fizzy water if you can, a pinch of salt, you know, make, make a tempura batter, um, beer batter even better. And just gently, you know, coat them and then just gently fry them until they're lightly golden. And in Northern Italy, we'd serve them with uh, with martini. Uh, th this is a pre-antipasto, antipasto, antipasto. So absolutely lovely. Grating of, shavings of Parmesan on top, serve them still warm. And you'll wonder why you didn't eat them your entire life. If the courgette or the pumpkin or squash is edible and the flowers are yellow, the, the flowers are edible. How many times have you ever switched on the news and heard the headline, five people died today from eating courgette flowers? It doesn't happen because they're edible. So if you've never done it before, do it. It's brilliant. You look it up online, research it if you want, but they're absolutely, you wonder why you didn't do it all, all along. Let me show you some other varieties because there are so many um, that are, are just absolutely brilliant. We don't all have gardens. We don't all have allotments. Some people grow in balconies. Some people grow uh, in pots and containers. But things like carrots are a little bit tricky to grow in, in containers unless the container is pretty deep. Um, you know, they have a long root and the, and the carrot itself is quite long. Um, this is a carrot from Paris. It's called Parisier Market. And as you can see, it's round. Um, pick it about the size of a golf ball. Another endangered variety, unfortunately. But it's perfect for growing in pots, especially if you get carrot root fly. Because what you can do is you can sow it in containers and then you can lift that container and put it up onto a, a wall or raise it because the carrot root fly flies along the ground. It really doesn't have much height to it. It's also really good for growing in between things uh, because it's quite a small, you know, quite, quite a compact carrot. And so, yeah, I, I'd really recommend um, Parisier uh, in, in that respect. Um, talking of, of carrots, uh, in Italian food, there are three vegetables which are considered so important that they're actually referred to as the holy trinity of Italian vegetables. And when I'm doing talks face to face and I, I'll ask the crowd and I'll say, what are these three vegetables? Now, invariably, I always get tomatoes, aubergines, basil, parsley. And it's not. It's actually carrots, celery and onion. Those are the three ingredients which give food so much flavour. And, you know, if, you, if you're cooks and you cook a lot from scratch, but, you know, to make a sauce, a tomato sauce for a pasta, it's always started with the Holy Trinity, um, tomato and um, tomatoes, uh, carrots, onions and celery. And um, that's really the, the backbone of, of, of uh, classic Italian um, cooking. Um, we spoke about uh, pumpkins. Let's look at some uh, some courgettes. This is sort of the classic Italian zucchini. This one's from Rome and restaurant quality. And what you'll, you'll find is when you go to Italy or France, actually, um, you'll see the zucchini and they're picked really small with the flowers still on the end. Whereas in the UK, we tend to grow them a little bit bigger. You know, we pick them medium sized. But if you can grow them small, uh, you get a much nuttier flavor. They're, they're very, very nice. Don't overcook them either. Um, and uh, marrows as well is, is, well, there's always that one courgette that you miss you know, underneath a leaf. And that's when, um, that that's a good one for stuffing, but they are sort of more used, marrows are more used in the UK, I, I, I would uh, uh, say than, than other countries, but I, I, I like a, a nice stuffed marrow as well. What I'd really like, this is a round courgette from, Piace, from Parma. And in Parma, they literally uh, stuff them. They, they cut them in half and they stuff them with the, um, two local ingredients of parma, which of course are parma ham and parmesan cheese. Again, Italian food is regional. Um, it's, it's known as cucina povera, peasant food, and every country in the world has peasant food. And peasant food has a couple of characteristics in common. It's cheap, it's local, 
and it's filling, you know, it's tasty. Lancashire hot pot, we mentioned Cornish pasty. They're, they're great examples of, of um, peasant dishes. So is, uh, so is um, oh, I don't know. Um, uh, there, there's just so many uh, uh, dishes that every, every country has, I've gone dry. Um, but certainly, you know, those are the three characteristics. Beans. Um, do you know who my best customers are? All you gardeners who planted your beans in February, um, because invariably uh, <laughs> it gets cold again and uh, you have to buy your beans again. Um, so I, I, I actually resign myself every year now. I have to fight back the urge. I always sow my beans April or May now. And uh, I, I resist that temptation. Uh, but I do have to be careful of, of snails. Uh, I get quite a few snails who love them. So this is a French bean from Venice. And it's, it's actually called Meraviglia di Venezia, Marvel of Venice. Top and tail it, it's stringless. Boil it for eight minutes. Dress it with a vinaigrette whilst it's still warm. And, you know, they're slightly waxy. They hold onto a vinaigrette beautifully. And you've just made yourself a beautiful summer bean salad. Serve it with a glass of wine, a hunk of bread, something else on the side, you know, that whatever you're, a, a bit of quiche or, or salami, whatever it might be. And you've got a really cracking meal. I love it. it it's, and that's stringless as well. And again, it's an endangered variety. It's on the slow food uh, endangered list. And another one that I really like, and no, it's not a salami plant. If it was, I'd be famous. Uh, this is a borlotti bean. But of course, we see borlotti beans in uh, in tins. Occasionally, we see them dried as well. Uh, but this is something that you can grow. You shouldn't pick it actually when it looks like that. You know, those pods look really healthy and fresh. Actually, what you want to do is you want to let those pods shrivel up and and not dry but be sort of leathery and then shell them please don't dry your your borlotti beans you can do drying is the oldest form of preserving of course but it's not the most you know it, it, let's say i inspire you tonight and you you go home well we're, we're already at home aren't we and you say right i'm going to make a minestrone oh hang on a minute i didn't soak them first for a day and then boil them for, for 30 or 40 minutes. And so if you shell them and freeze them in batches, um, in portions, then you can actually just take a handful from the freezer, <coughs> excuse me, and you can you can throw them into, into your stew. I mean, a stew's gonna take at least an hour. You know, th these will take 30, minute, 30, 40 minutes from frozen or a casserole, or even into a risotto, um, absolutely lovely. And, the, you know, again, it's peasant food. These are things that, that fill out a dish. Actually, they're really tasty and really, really good for you as well. Um, Cavallo Nero kale. Interesting. We sell more Cavallo Nero. So Frankie sell more Cavallo Nero kale in the UK than we do in Italy. And the reason for that is, well, there's two reasons. First of all, Italy is not a country. Italy is 20 different countries, so it's 20 regions. And those of you who've been to Italy, you know that each region is completely different. And so um, this is really only found in Tuscany. And it's winter hardy. Again, why is it winter hardy? Uh, Tuscany is true, it does have hot summers, but boy, does it have cold winters. And so it's a brassica, it's used to sub-zero. And I plant mine in the, in the uh, autumn, late summer, uh, May, June, July, really, uh, late summer. And then I harvest it right through the winter. So this is a, a great idea of where that provenance, be it being that it's used to the cold, um, has made it uh, winter hardy, basically. Um, and the other reason is that every Victorian uh, would bring back the seeds. Have you ever seen the film A Room with a View? Uh, that was the story of that is about the Grand Gira, the Grand Tours. And so uh, that was the rite of passage for the for the sons and daughters of noblemen. Uh, and they would be sent off to Tuscany or Chianti Shire, as it's otherwise known, because there are so many Brits there. And um, and they would, you know, learn about culture and language and art and, you know, whatever it was and food, and whatever. But they would always bring the seeds back. In fact, if you were to recreate a, uh, a Victorian walled garden kitchen garden without cavolo nero it wouldn't be italian cavolo nero it would not be a, a a good representation because the victorians grew grew it a lot and also um you know even thomas cook the, the person 
um, he organized tours on the railway train, because don't forget this was a new, a new thing um, to Tuscany. And so, you know, really these, these varieties started to come back and go out as well. Don't forget that it's not a one, but borders aren't one way, borders are two way. And so um, we, we were able to take things out as well. A couple of other things I'll, I'll show you. This is one that you can be sowing now, lamb's lettuce or mash or lamb's tongue or corn salad. It's got a bit of an identity crisis, but essentially uh, it's a really soft melt in the mouth leaf, uh, which I had for dinner tonight actually. And um, you sow it in the spring, but the main season for sowing it is uh, August, September, October, uh, July, August, September, October. And I've eaten it outside, just covered in one of those Hacksnicks, you know, cloches with the wire hoops. Um, in February, I've had it outside in Harrow. So it just goes to show, unfortunately, because it has the word lamb in it, lamb's lettuce or lamb's tongue, lots of people think it's only, only for spring, you know, and, and it's really important to, you know, I think we're the best country in the world at sowing in spring. I don't think we're so good at sowing seasonally, you know, and, and really when you pull something up, you should put something in. Yeah, December and January are the lean months, but there's always an animal, there's always a, an insect, there's always something that, that will be happy um, to have continued uh growing of of vegetables especially bees and and other pollinators you know when, when you say about pollinators people always automatically think just of bees male mosquitoes are are, are huge pollinators it's only only the females that bite you <laughs> and uh, ladybirds and butterflies you know and hoverflies so um that's right isn't it simon i mean it's just really important to keep that planting going and not just be a spring gardener you know absolutely not even even those salad bags you know you know the, those mixed salads this is a a, 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 a lettuce a romaine lettuce but when you buy those mixed salad bags stagger the sowing you should be able to sow that really from april may right through to september and it's cut and come again i have two pots on the go uh, one which i'm eating and the other one which i'm growing and then when i finish eating the one that i was eating I start eating the other one and the other one starts to grow back and we're not more than two or three times because then it starts to, to go woody you know um so look there are just so many varieties chilies you know you should be doing chilies now uh, march april um i was just chatting with someone before that there are shortages this year um in in the uk i, I don't need to tell you the stories how difficult it is to export and how difficult it is to import it really is hard um, um, but things like tomatoes, uh, lots of seed companies are only just now getting tomatoes. We've not managed to import a single packet of tomatoes, peppers this year. Um, so don't feel, because gar us gardeners, we're creatures of habit. I had a guy say to me today, it's too late to sow tomatoes. And I was like, it's the 19th of March. You can sow tomatoes to the end of April. If you sow a tomato, in the middle of February, and you sow tomato the middle of April, that's a two month difference. The eating difference is only two weeks. And he was saying, mm, I'm not sure about this. So I said, well, I'll tell you something else. If you drop a tomato in your greenhouse in October or November, and the seeds go into that into the soil, when will those seeds germinate again? January, February? He said, okay, I've got it. Yeah, of course, when it warms up. And will they make fruits? Yes, of course, because that's the whole purpose of life is reproduction. That seed wants to reproduce for the next year, the next generation, the next generation. So, of course, it will mature. So, look, I've done 40 minutes, which is which is spot on. Um, there are so many varieties to talk about. Things like chickpeas, um, which you can grow. Um, and in fact, it's a really good one to grow down the allotment because the um, the leaves look somewhat like marijuana. So if you want to get everyone talking, um, but we, we actually, whenever we do a garden at Hampton Court, we always have um, chickpea plants on there. And we've been reported three times to the RHS for having <laughs> marijuana on our garden. So, of course, we always grow it um, just because we, 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 we like to shake it up a little bit. But 
Simon, over to you. Are there any specific questions you wanted to ask me about Harrow or about bio? I, I guess what I've been talking about is biodiversity and all of these regional varieties. You know, rather than everyone growing sun gold gardens like Shirley, Alicante, Moneymaker, um, is to support local. And when I say, when I say local, I don't just mean you know local varieties like this. I, I also mean like local greengrocers and local butchers and local short stores, especially during this pandemic it's been really difficult so yeah that that's what i would i would say um okay well we've had a quite a few questions in the in the chat which i'll go through but um i'm particularly interested in um hearing your thoughts about planting a mixture of not just vegetables but also mixing in flowers in a month yeah. of vegetables yeah I, absolutely look um I've got a patch. I, I always used to just, I always used to say, if you can't eat it, don't grow it. Right. That's what I always used to say, but I've changed my tune. I, um, I, before the, uh, this session started, I was chatting. Um, I actually grow stinging nettles. I grow them behind the shed. I, I can't see them. And actually we make uh, tea from them sometimes and we use them in place of spinach. So we pick the young leaves and we, and we make, um, instead of spinach and ricotta cannelloni, we make nettle and ricotta uh, cannelloni. But my garden was full of butterflies last year and the year before, absolutely sitting outside in the summer heat, butterflies everywhere. 97% of butterfly habitat has gone. They're not attractive, but you know, if you can do a little patch, why not? You know, it's not, it's it's about the planet it's about it's about doing your bit flowers as well you know any if you can get a mixture we have a um a little bed of of flowers now which are pollinator friendly and it looks really lovely you know it's not it's not kempt and manicured uh we've got that up on the patio we've got pots with olive trees and you know the the, the nice bit there and then we've got my veggies and so we've got a, we've got those four things really and that's the feature of my garden and i think the more diversity you can have in your garden the better for biodiversity yeah and i think also people tend to forget that um creatures like butterflies and moths are not butterflies and moths for their whole lives i mean they mm. need plants yeah. to lay eggs on and they yeah. need plants to eat as larvae um and they also need somewhere to, um, quite a few insects need somewhere to hide over the winter. Yeah. Um, so we need to try to give them mixed habitat as much as possible. And it's yeah, and you, you were talking, do. yeah, you were talking about uh, wild borders on, on the side of roads as well. And I think that's a great idea. And I know a couple of councils that have looked at this and uh, I think one of them is doing it. Is it isn't in Eastington or somewhere? I can't remember. I think yeah. they all are around Harrow. Unfortunately, Good. Harrow's a little bit slow to, cotton on but you hold yeah. them on i'll hit them right fire a question at me um okay well we've had a couple of people mention the b word and i thought we were going to try to avoid that but <laughs> um, hey, look i think it's a reality that. and and unfortunately before world war ii in the uk there were more than 40 um, packet seed companies we're talking about packet seeds we're not talking about farming here um who produced their own seeds for their own um their own packets and now there are none, you know, none of those brands produce their own seeds, their own packets anymore. They may, they may produce the odd element here and there. And so, um, you know, it's estimated that less than half of the, of the seeds in domestic seed packets come from the UK. Um, lots of the big suppliers are China, India, Israel, uh, Egypt, Kenya, Zambia, America, Chile, Australia, Vietnam, which are hot countries as it happens, and the EU. And so, you know, what could possibly go wrong? You know, we, we really are suffering um, trying to import, and that is the reality. And all food comes from seed. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it is an issue and um, uh, we, we don't know what the solution is at the moment, but something needs to change. Yeah, we've got a couple of people here from America and Canada. I um, saw. Do you export? Yeah, um, we don't export. Um, we, we're the UK importers and distributors, but there are both um, uh, distributors in Canada 
and in America. And if you email, uh, if you go to seedsofitaly.com, you can get our email from there and we can uh, uh, email us and we'll, we'll give you the links to um, uh, to those uh, distributors. And the same for Ireland, because no UK seed company now is able, is allowed to ship to Ireland or any EU country or Northern Ireland. So if you are in any of those places, I see we've got a pretty mixed... Um, uh, view, viewers uh, tonight, uh, all, crowd tonight, um, then just email us and we'll tell you where you can you can buy them locally. Yeah, okay. Um, Mary was asking about the name of a courgette, which she describes as being yellow and knobbly. Yes, I don't have one here to show you. So courgettes in Italy, zucchini in Italy are all regional. Literally, pretty much every region has its own variety. And... Um, it's really amazing. And that's why when you go to Italy and you travel around, the cuisine changes. I mean, it can change from town to town, uh, if not village to village. It's crazy. The yellow knobbly courgette that you're uh, referring to there, Simon, is from the Veneto region. Um, and it's it's really ugly. I don't have a I don't have a picture to show you. I don't want to have one here to show you, but it's very very ugly. And um, my auntie is is from the Veneto region. So imagine this yellow, warty, horrible, misshapen um, courgette. And I was speaking to her. She's quite elderly. And I said to her, Zia, I, I, I go to the markets, and I see everyone buying these 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 yellow courgettes. Why don't you buy the green ones? You know, because everyone else uses the green ones. And she thought for a second, and she said, Well, we do see the green ones in the market from time to time, but we don't like to buy them because they look funny. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go on our website and, and look at the courgettes, you'll see it straight away and you'll go, oh, my God. I mean, it really is ugly, but it has a firmer consistency when you cook it. So for some dishes, it lends itself really, really well to those dishes. Um, Richard, I don't know what this refers to, but Richard was asking um, me to ask you about your Brexit survival kit. OK, <laughs> so. Um, for a laugh, after a couple of grappers, uh, we put together a kit a few years ago and we called it a Brexit vegetable survival kit. It's actually really well thought out. It's something to harvest every, not so, something to harvest every single month of the year. There are 12 uh, varieties that you can harvest and you can store or you can eat fresh in the winter um and they can be grown in either containers or um in, in the ground so to give you an example there's little gherkins where you can eat them fresh or you can pickle them there's french beans you can eat them fresh or you can pickle them there's uh, pumpkins you, you can store pumpkins over winter you know so th there's really something for everyone it's it's a really clever idea anyway we did a tweet we knocked up a picture and we did one tweet and we went into work the next day and I did seven interviews, three of them on TV. And uh, we, we were on the one show and we, um, we were on. So it was great. It was a really nice, um, you know, it was a, it was a really nice, uh, I won't say stunt, but because it's actually really well thought out. But we do a Brexit version and a, a non-Brexit version. So, yeah, a bit, a bit of fun, tongue in cheek. Uh, somebody was asking... Sorry, I can't, I've, I've lost the name, but um, when do you pick your lotti beans? Okay, so plant your beans. Uh, I, I, as I said before, I would plant my beans in April or May now. I, I really, you know, fed up of losing them year after year. Um, and so the, the, the point is, if you wait for the pods to go past that stage where they look fresh and here we go, where they look really fresh and healthy and sexy. And, you know, look at me, you know, I'm bright and colorful. And you really want them to be sad and manky looking and leathery and shriveled, um, but not dry unless you want to dry them. And so it, it is when it is, you know, and, and that's the thing about gardening is that if you're, you can get 10 people growing exactly the same vegetable in 10 different parts of the country or the world and they'll all be growing it successfully but in different ways you know different timings etc and gardening is so subjective you know it's it's there are some some constants but there's an awful lot of, of um, variables as well so that's what I would say pick your bolotti when they're, they're, they're shriveled and uh, and then shell them and freeze them if you're going to dry them 
let them dry, the pods dry completely on the plant. And then, uh, but don't just jar them straight away because you know what will happen. We've all done it. A month later, you've got moldy bolotti beans in the jar. Make sure you put them in the air in cupboard or in the sun and make sure they're really dry, dry before you um, containerize them. Okay. Um, what, uh, somebody was asking what we would be your top five seeds. Oh my gosh, I tell you what, this is one of them. The, the spinach I mentioned before, because you can't buy spinach, the San Marzano tomato as well. This is one of my absolute favorites. Now in America, it's called broccoli rabe. In Italian, it's called cima di rapa, turnip tops. But it's essentially um, a, a type of broccoli. Um, if I was to say to you, if I was to ask you, well, what's the most Italian vegetable, you, you would probably all say tomatoes or, or um, basil. It's actually broccoli. It's even got an Italian name, broccoli. Um, and each region, again, has its own broccoli. And this is the one from Puglia. Now, it's the vegetable that's eaten uh, in 40 days. It grows in 40 days. So you stagger the sowing. It's more a summer brassica than a winter brassica. If you look at broccoli broccoli like calabrese um that's a really high quality but it takes five months you know six months to grow five months to grow it and uh, whereas this is 40 days and it's always eaten with orecchiette pasta little ears they're they're pasta shapes they they kind of flick them they make them outside the houses flick them in puglia and uh with anchovies and chili and oh, there they have olive oil it's a wonderful wonderful vegetable really good for you full of iron um, if you let it flower as well, and it will go to seed really quickly. So when you see it looks healthy like that, you know, pick it and eat it. Um, the bees adore it. I mean, it's great. When I, I, I sometimes leave a little patch just for the bees. Um, so that's definitely one. The other one is Swiss chard. I touched on it before. I reckon Swiss chard is a very underrated an underused vegetable in this country. I think it's used much more on the continent. You have that lovely white stalk, which you can parboil and then toss it in a pan with butter or olive oil and a pinch of salt and you know a little bit, bit of garlic, however you want, serve it with fried eggs and a slice of bread. You know, it's, it's, it's and, and it comes back again. That's the other good thing. So it will overwinter, it will die back. And then in the spring, you know, talk about a gift from up there. It comes back to life and you've got loads of, of, of lovely chard that you can eat. Um, and it has that same earthy flavour as beetroot. This is a beetroot from the Veneto region, the stripy one. You might have seen that. Um, and that's because they're related. They're cousins. And that's why you get red Swiss chard as well, which I still have in my garden completely uncovered. I've got loads of it growing. I think I think there's quite a few crops that you can actually um, pick like that, like the chard. I mean, I do that with lettuces. You don't yeah. have to just pick the whole lettuce. Yeah, just pick the outer leaves, and you can keep that going for two or three weeks at least. I've just seen a lot. I've seen a comment: chard, nice with smoked haddock and a poached egg. <laughs> I'll be round at eight. <laughs> oh, it's eight thirty. Um, <laughs> I'm late. Somebody was asking if you had any tips for growing fennel. Right. Yes, I do. You can't be good at everything. I'm good at making bread. I, I love making bread. I enjoy it, it comes out. I'm not good at making pastry. My mum is really good at making pastry, but she's not good at baking bread. And it's the same for fennel. I was at a show and this chap came onto uh, our stand, I think it was Chelsea or Hampton Court, came onto our stand and he said, um, I'm not very good at growing fennel. What's the trick? And I said to him, well, I'm not very good at growing fennel, but there happened to be the, um, the editor of TKG magazine, the Kitchen Garden mag magazine, uh, Steve. And I said to him, Steve, got a, a, a customer here for you. He wants to know um, about growing fennel. Can you help? He said, I'm not very good at growing fennel. But what I've learned over the years is there are two types of fennel, um, of bulb fennel, Florence fennel. Again, why is it called Florence fennel when there are so many regional uh, varieties of fennel? Um, and that's because of the... Brits who used to go to Tuscany, the Grand Digira, the Grand Tours. But there are two. There's the fennel that you sow March, April, May, 
And then there's the fennel that you sow, there's alpine fennel, which you sow June, July, August. And I find that sowing the alpine fennel works better here. You sow it later, you harvest it later, but it bulbs up. And in fact, the variety name, which you can't see, is Monte Bianco, which you all know as the Mont Blanc. It's the, uh, that's the region it comes from. It's the mountain that separates Italy from Switzerland, France, uh, Italy from Switzerland. And so again, it's being an Alpine variety, it's got provenance. And I always explain that to people by, by saying, get a Norwegian and a Brazilian and put them outside on a cold night. Who's gonna feel the cold? Of course, the Brazilian's gonna feel the cold. And that's what provenance means. You know, that lo that's why local varieties like this from uh, the Alps is, are important uh, because they, they have some resistance, they, they, they cope well in our climate. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I was gonna say fennel, start, fennel and celeriac, you should start off in cells. That always seems to work better. Um, and then transplant them out uh, into a, a, a sunny position with a nice rich soil, but not recently manured. And yeah, give it a go, but try, try the alpine fennel. Um, Edna was actually saying, I, yeah, I think it was Edna was saying that fennel likes to have its own patch and doesn't. Yeah, like yeah, it. yeah. I, I leave a, a a a little patch in in the bed just for fennel. Yeah, good one. Um, and she was also asking. Um, she's in the northeast of the USA. Um, she dug up a a chard plant and she kept it in the garage over the winter. Is it going to be okay if she replants it? So what chard does, it makes these, these not rhizomes, well, I, I don't know if it's technically called a rhizome, but it's not like a wiry root. And uh, that's why it comes back again every year, because it's got this hard rhizome-like uh, root, like asparagus almost um, can, can have, but, but just not so much of it. Um, give it a try, you know, chuck it back in the ground. Yeah. Um, there was a question on... Dig versus no dig. What are your Yay, thoughts? Charles Dowding. Right. He yeah. uses some of our seeds. Charles is a legend. I mean, look, um, whether you do or you don't, have a look at his veg plot. I mean, it is epic. <laughs> you know, talk about it's a work of uh, art. Pre yeah, yeah, doing what you preach. Um uh, it, it is really, really good. I, I know there'll be some people here who definitely um, swear by the no dig method. Um, uh, I'm just lazy. So so often um, my no dig is is just because I work too hard and I'm lazy. <laughs> but no, I like to give, I, I like to um, give one area of my garden a good turning over. I live in London and I have, I have London clay, but actually I'd rather have clay than really sandy or really chalky because you can add the, the the treatment the cure is the same for all three and that's organic matter and at least with clay you get something yes it bakes in the summer and it's waterlogged in the winter but you know what it's really nutritious and uh, you can grow lots of things in it root vegetables can be a bit of a pain but you can lighten it up um, but someone with sandy soils doing the opposite you know they're, they're, they're trying to add organic mixture to make it heavier um, so yeah well, we all have our our soils every garden is unique I, th I think it's a it's a completely different system i mean no dig is not really a lazy system but you have no to... no i was just joking i was saying yeah no i realize yeah. that but <laughs> i mean it, it's it's a different type of work but you have to know what you're doing and, and and you have to i would thoroughly recommend getting on youtube and having a couple of yeah. golf doubting videos it's definitely um I think... Can I throw in? Can I throw in one thing? It's a question I always get asked, and that's how do you store seeds? Now, this is is not just for Frankie seeds; it's for any seeds. And um, you know, if you've got a plant in your garden which you really admire and it's come up beautifully, you might want to save those seeds. So, how do you do it? Well, it's, it's actually there's actually two parts to this answer. And the first thing is that seeds have a scale of longevity. So, if you're talking about vegetables tomatoes are the kings look you can get 10 year out of date tomato seeds and you can sow them and i bet you many of them would 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 germinate what's the worst one parsnips sow them and throw them is the saying always buy fresh um parsnip seeds and um that's the first thing so so to remember there's a scale of longevity the second thing is always put them somewhere 
in, an, in an airtight container, preferably of glass or metal. Mice and rats can chew through plastic and uh, put them somewhere cool, dark and airy. I once had a lady ring me up and she said, I bought five of your varieties and none of them germinated. So I said, well, uh, how old are they, first of all? She said, oh, no, they all germinated the first year. That was fine. I said, well, where did you store them? And she said, oh, in the, in the drawer above the oven. <laughs> so um, I, I think that's probably that's probably it. Um, I've just sort of seen a, 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 a comment here about um, I've just turned a patch of lawn at the start of the pandemic into a veg plat, uh, veg patch. Uh, Use Charles Dowding's uh, method and it worked really well. What's really interesting is that last March, uh, the UK went into lockdown and all of a sudden people were thrust uh into a into a situation where they many of them were at home some with children uh, many with children and and we're really lucky in the uk in a way because if you go to places like milan the, you, there's there's more apartments and less back gardens do you know what i mean we, and look at harrow somewhere aren't we lucky in harrow but even my in-laws in brixton they have a yard and it's enough to grow raspberries and to and and have a table and chairs and stuff so you know that is really typical we um it was estimated that there are three million new uh, or, or or people returning to growing vegetables because of covid last year and that's continued uh, because of brexit i have to say um somebody was asking an interesting question we had i wondered about or why are seed packets so difficult to open <laughs> okay, well, first of all, uh, you don't want air getting into them. So there are two types of seed packets. Um, the first one is what they call thermo sealed. So it's like two pieces of paper, if you like, uh, and they're, they're sealed together like heat sealed around the edges. And so they're airtight, but the seed is loose inside. And they usually have a plastic coating. There, and the, the reason for that is so that you can't rip them um so easily you know or like us uh, paper packets with, with a with a varnish but with a so they're paper they're recyclable but they have a foil insert and foil inserts keep the seeds fresher as well so it's it's to basically not allow uh, air in um and that's probably why <laughs> okay uh, somebody gave me a really good tip years ago which is to tear the bottom or cut the bottom of the seed packet rather than the top so you keep the name of the seeds because quite often you tear the top off and you lose the description um, absolutely somebody was asking about treviso chicory it's still okay a bed. do i harvest the whole plant or just right leave? so treviso chicory when you buy your salad bag in the supermarket, you get those lovely red and white stripy uh, chicories. I hate to use the word chicories in the UK. People recoil. It's like when you say endive and they think of the sort of the frise, tough and bitter leaves. I actually love them. And they're winter hardy to a point. The thing with radicchio is radicchio is any red chicory and chicory in, in, in English. We say chicory for green and, and radicchio for red. Radicchios need sub-zero, they need cold. So you sow them in the summer and late summer. And then um, it's from Treviso. Treviso is in the Dolomites. You go skiing in Treviso. So again, it's a vegetable that because of its provenance, it's basically, uh, it, will, it will look green. It will look like a romaine lettuce. And you'll look at it and you look at the packet and then you look at, and it won't, and you'll think I've been squeezed. And as it turns cooler and colder, that uh, those leaves will start to first blush and then they'll start to turn red. And more importantly, they'll become sweeter. Um, what we're also very scared of doing in the UK as well is, and, and you're gonna be harvested these outside, by the way, all through January and February, um, is we're a bit scared to cook leaves in, the, in this country. And things like radicchio are perfect. You can have them raw in a salad, or you can have them in a, a risotto alla trevigiana. So that's a risotto, which is creamy. You have that lovely, pleasant bitterness of the radicchio. You've got the saltiness of sausage, whether it's a vegan sausage or a real sausage, you know, a meat sausage. And, and you've got, um, you know, you've got these contrasting flavors, a bit of cheese on top, so you get that cheesiness. Another great recipe for radicchio 
as you get the whole radicular head. So what you're looking at is the uh, what you're throwing away those outer leaves. Look, if you go outside in the cold, you wear a coat. So you're only after that heart inside. Put the heart on a baking tray with a little bit of olive oil on the bottom. And then you put mozzarella and then you put parma ham on top. It's got to be in that order. And this is a dish called carabinieri a cavallo, um, policeman on horseback. Um, and you stick it under a salamander, under a grill. And what happens is when the, when the ham, the parma ham starts to curl up like the peak of a policeman's cap, that's when the mozzarella's warm through and the radicchio's warm through. And you have this lovely antipasto that you can serve. That's called policeman on horseback. So, gosh, it's I could talk all night. You've got my, this is my subject. I'm really passionate about it. I think, though, from from what you're doing, Simon, is encouraging and inspiring people in Harrow. But, you know, we've got such a great mix of people uh, go back over. There was people from Lancashire and Orkney and, and all sorts, Suffolk. And I saw Cornwall. You know, what would you say to those people to get them to get growing or, or you know where should they start how should they do it i don't i don't know i think just have a go i mean i, I think that's the most important thing it, it doesn't matter how big a garden you have or even if you don't have a garden i mean if you watch gardeners world and programs like that um they are encouraging you to use balconies and pots even indoors i mean you can grow herbs indoors just mm. just have a go yeah um and if you fail then lost nothing you'd probably learn learn a little bit yeah i agree with you and i, th I think as well that um there's nothing negative about growing veg or flowers it's, it's all win 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 um even with plastic pots always reuse plastic pots don't just throw them because you think oh plastic bad must throw that's in fact you know you get the most out of them don't buy any new ones but just make the most out of the pots that you've got and just use them and 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 then just get rid of them at the, at, at, you know recycle them at, at the last minute and there's so much that we can all do and try to buy the good quality ones because they last for years and then these flimsy plastic trays and they, yeah. you'll yeah. get one or two seasons out of them where <laughs> you can get the decent ones now yeah. um, which should last you 10 years um well, i think we need really need to wrap it up i mean for yeah. multiple reasons um gardeners world is starting tonight at nine o'clock <laughs> so i'm sure everybody wants to get onto the tv have stuff. you mentioned the uh, discount code ah yes um I think what I can do is email it out to everybody who's registered. Um, but if you would like to contact either Paolo or myself, um, there is an email address on the on the invite. 